Our next speaker is Steve Messer. Uh, he's got this website entitled Harsh Browns, which uh, has a really cool URL. It's on visitmy.website. Uh, it's the best URL I've seen for a while. And he writes about lots of interesting stuff there, design, agile delivery, um, government things. Um, really cool. Uh, from that website, I also found out he is currently planning a trip to Japan. He loves running and he is working on getting his driving license. So good luck with that. In this talk, he is going to share some lessons from working on the Gov.uk UK design system uh, that he used to work on uh, and also other platforms that he worked on in the UK government. Uh, and um, yeah, I'm really excited for this talk. Um, it's great to have Steve here. Uh, and without further ado, um, yeah, Steve, the floor is all yours. Uh, and thanks so much for, uh, for joining us today. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm just going to try and uh, get my screen set up now. So hopefully uh, the slides should be coming through now. Can you see that? Yes. Wow. Thank you very much. Uh, and yeah, on the Miro board, if anyone does have any recommendations of places to go into Japan, please let me know. <laughs> um, I've been collecting like so many from everyone uh, and everyone's been really kind and sort of saying where they went that was really really good uh, so it's always good to see where people go but yeah so this is a talk on common direction and boring magic uh as Hilda said i'm steve and i do product uh you can find me on the socials there so mastodon uh, is that top one and then blue sky is just my website url um yeah why did i put those quotes around product i think like product's a bit of a weird job i think it's like the perfect embodiment of jack of all trades master of none uh, which means I'm a generalist, really. Uh, I'm really interested in like a range of web and digital things, but I'm definitely not a specialist. Um, I will give an early caveat as well. I don't think this is a super good talk. It's kind of, it's a bit, the, it's the same way as I talk when I'm in a room with people. It just sort of weaves and winds all over the place. And I've tried to give it some structure. I did actually spend like two or three weeks really worrying about the structure. And then in the end, just went back to some notes that I made in Spain in, in June. So Hopefully that goes well, but I'm just going to share some ideas I've had, things that I've seen work well, and then some thinking that like has popped up through my brain over the time that I've been working on government platforms over the years, and also my time on the gov.uk design system. Uh, so a little bit more about me. I've been doing product for 10 years, uh, sometimes well, sometimes not so well. It has mostly been in the public sector, including gov.uk, gov.uk pay, and the gov.uk design system. Uh, and then for one period of time, I did work at an early stage startup as well. And that was all around uh, research and development tax credits. So I kept it, you know, in the boring problem space. Um, and I've been really lucky to work with, near some like very clever, clever people over the years. I think one of the reasons that I kept in the public sector so much is that like working in the public sector is a really special thing. There are lots of reasons to get out of bed in the morning. You know, you're not just creating profit for someone else. And so like having a purpose driven job is it's a real privilege. You know, uh, it's hard work at times, but it definitely is a privilege. Uh, so how did I get here? Um, I didn't start out in product uh, from 16 to 21. I was a chef. Then I worked in publishing for two years. Uh, and then I sort of had a bit of a quarter life crisis when I realized I didn't want to do that. Uh, so I looked back at, you know, everything I'd done and uh, things I enjoyed. And as a teenager, I really enjoyed like building websites. And so that's what brought me to, to tech and product in the end. And yeah, I sort of discovered the beauty of the web when I was 12. And I don't know what your story is, but it's probably quite similar. Um, I borrowed a book about HTML from the library and sort of just used it to create a silly little website. And I remember at the time it feeling like absolutely amazing that I could speak this special language that computers could understand and all these uh, all this text and colors and images could appear on a page uh, and I could just sort of create things freely. Um, and it felt like magic, it really did. And I don't think that feeling of magic has ever really disappeared. Uh, but yeah, what is this talk all about? So um, a lot of it comes from something I was asked to work on in 2023 where I sort of asked to prepare a growth strategy for the Gov.uk design system. And growth is a weird thing. It's one of those like producty words, which, you know, everyone's like, what do you mean by that? But it usually means like adding more value or providing value to more people, essentially. 
And I think there's a lot we can learn from the web when it comes to growing and managing a design system. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean hiring more developers or designers. Um, so yeah, if we look at the web as a model for growing a design system, there is a bit of a debate happening in UK government right now and sort of on social media about whether there should be a central design system to rule them all, or whether each department in government should be allowed to run their own design system. My thesis is it's a bit of a mix of the two. So the debate shouldn't be central versus federated, but rather how we combine elements of both to create a better model. Um, and that's the thing about the web, right? Like the beautiful thing at the heart of it is how it gives people the power to create and publish. And it is about small pieces loosely joined and about nodes in a network. So yeah, there is no central body to the web. There are common standards, principles, and ways of working. Uh, and that's what holds it together. That's what makes it great. Um, it's not perfect, obviously, like the web has changed a lot over the last 25 years and it's undoubtedly caused some problems, but that's not the business that we're in. I think if you're working in tech or digital in government, you're usually here to create public good. And a lot of good has come from the web, like we, we can't deny that, you know, all this, the sort of digital transformation work that we all do to make people's experiences online better, that's definitely some good stuff. Um, so yeah, these concepts of common standards, principles, and ways of working, like I do think that they're useful. Also, if you zoom out widely, the model for digital transformation in the UK government was quite similar to that. So Gov.uk started around about 2012, and it was a central idea, but it deliberately shared power out, and it did that through common standards, principles, and ways of working. Um, I'll go through these now, but uh, the three key like documents for the government service standard, the government design principles, and then the service manual, which really helped set the baseline for how to create digital services in government. Uh, they kind of describe what good looks like, but they don't really tell you how to do your job. So there's room to innovate and adapt. But yeah, if we dive in and look at those a bit more closely. So the government design principles, um, these are, I really like these. Uh, I'll work through them. So start with user needs, do less, design with data, do the hard work to make it simple, iterate, then iterate again. This is for everyone. Understand context, build digital services, not websites, be consistent, not uniform. And then my favorite one, make things open, it makes things better. And so the purpose of these is, like I said before, they show you how to ensure that services are simple, accessible and open and, and, and what good looks like. And they're really cool. You might be able to see echoes of dear to Rams in there. There's a little bit of lean startup in there as well. And, and there's a little bit of hacker culture. And they sort of explain some of the sort of ways of thinking and the sort of influences that were there in the early days of government digital service. The, the principles act a bit like a credo or a manifesto as well. And I've heard people across UK government mention these principles, even if they never worked on gov.uk or, or at GDS. And so they've got this like unifying quality to them. So yeah, we also have the service standard, um, and this is really the sort of the, the check to make sure that people are working towards the standards. And it definitely says like what the baseline is for what a good service looks like. Uh, there's quite a lot, but I will like read through them. So understand users and their needs. So solve a whole problem for users, provide a joined up experience across all channels, make the service simple to use, make sure everyone can use the service, have a multidisciplinary team, use agile ways of working, iterate and improve frequently, create a secure service, which protects users' privacy, define what su success looks like and publish performance data choose the right tools and technology, make new source code open, use and contribute to open standards, common components and patterns, and then operate a reliable service. Um, so yeah, as a service is being developed uh, and it goes through the alpha, beta and live stages, which is like prototyping, the first time you're gonna be like really build it and release it to users and then fully releasing it live, it goes through an assessment at these different stages um, it works a bit like a peer review, so an assessment panel will be made up of uh, a product manager, uh, a tech lead, a designer, a developer, and usually like a performance analyst as well. And they sort of look at the way a service has been designed and developed 
uh, and give feedback on A, whether it meets the standard or B, whether there's anything that could be changed or improved. And that really helps ensure that a team is working to meet the standard or can just actually be re receiving feedback to make it better. Uh, it really acts as a good yardstick for anyone, for anyone who isn't familiar with tech or digital as well, which is helpful. Like it, it does become a bit of an education tool. Um, and for anyone who is familiar, it sets a baseline from which you can sort of go further and, and achieve more or like exceed expectations. So the final part of the puzzle is uh, these lightweight guides in the service manual, which uh, help teams sort of uh, do good work on accessibility and assisted digital, agile delivery, design, measuring success, like how to actually go through a service assessment, uh, how they should build technology, how to like form a team, and then uh, how to conduct user research. Uh, yeah, and the purpose of this is because government is huge and there's many people who've never worked on a digital service before, they have this lightweight manual uh, or a playbook for how to do things. Uh, and it's got many sections on the relevant parts of how to like set up and run a team, which is probably why there isn't a section in their product management. <laughs> I think you're supposed to just read the whole thing uh, and work through it. But um, yeah. But so what, right? Like, why have all these standards, principles and ways of working? Um, well, really, if we share common ways of working and common solutions, many actors can help transform government independently, but all aligned and sort of going in one direction. And that's the truth, really, is like government isn't one thing. It's made up of lots of organisations, staffed with thousands of people, all of whom could go off in different directions. And so you sort of, these standards and the different ways of working, they help prevent too much entropy and like too much decay from everything falling apart. And they help like keep things together a little bit. So I'll move on to the second part. And you know, if we're moving in a common direction together, how might we make the most of that? Um, you might be familiar with the story, like the Gov.uk design system came together through community. Uh, so designers and developers across government were all working on building services for Gov.uk. Uh, and they found that they liked what people in other teams had come up with, for example, if someone's like implemented a button slightly better than you had, uh, people would ask to reuse each other's codes and designs. Um, so they decided to create a place where everyone could share those designs and common patterns uh, for interaction design problems. Uh, this is what it looks like. It, can you see like a screenshot of a page? Yes, fantastic. So this is the hack pad and this is where they kept it all. It's a bit of a sort of Google Doc. Um, yeah, it required people to, to make contributions. And I think it had like quite a lot of curative effort in there as well. Like people actually had to go out and curate and engage with the community in order to build this stuff up. And that's where you can see the first signs of a central effort start to appear where like the, that effort of curating the design system from the center, uh, of collecting and collating the small pieces and, and bringing it to the center uh, it is actually happening. There is a really beautiful uh, reason that that was happening though, that comes from the design principle, design principles. Um, and there's a, there's a line in it that really empowers that work. Um, so number nine, the be consistent, not uniform one. Uh, this says that we should use the same language and the same design patterns where possible. This helps people get familiar with our services, but when this isn't possible, we should make sure our approach is consistent. This isn't a straight jacket or a rule book. Every circumstance is different. When we find patterns that work, we should share them and talk about why we use them. And this is the key bit. So that shouldn't stop us from improving or changing them in the future when we find better ways of doing things or the needs of users change. And that's my emphasis at the end because it's a really important part of the principle. It sort of acknowledges that many teams are working to build services across government, often in different contexts, and that we might find better ways of doing things. So one should feel empowered to explore that and sort of share it back to the community when we find something better that works. Um, that's one of the things you find actually is, is people often think that a design system is the way you have to do it. It's like they feel like it is a rule book and it's not. It is just a starting position and we have to sort of make sure that, feel, that people feel comfortable um, iterating and expanding and improving it. So the community was brought together to discuss their design systems as well. And, and this is an important point in the history of design systems in UK government. Like I said earlier, there's this debate going on about whether uh, the central design system 
has failed because there are other design systems around government. But you can see that historically, that's sort of where it came from. So why not keep that going? Um, yeah, that design system really did come from a network or a web of design systems, and it is now the sum of those parts. So then a couple of years after the WK design system had been launched, uh, the contribution model followed soon after. I'm sure you'll recognize one of the authors of this blog post, Amy Hupe. Um, she's helped, she helped design and introduce the contribution model with Ignacia, who's an excellent service designer, and Amy writes a lot about design systems. Um, and that contribution model allows every one of those nodes in a network to contribute learning and designs to each other node through this shared resource. I think this is the really big point I want to make is that a contribution model really is there to empower the nodes in the network to share things with each other. Like that's how they communicate with each other. So while there, there is this centralization of effort to curate the resource, which looks like a centralized thing, it actually requires that federated network to make contributions. So again, it's the interaction of these two things. So let's look at that in a bit more detail. Yeah, like rather than viewing the design system as a central design system, which negates the existence of other design systems, I think it's possible for all of these to coexist and empower one another. And, uh, and there's some research from a political economist which supports that. Some of you may know her work, uh, Eleanor Ostrom, who was the first woman to win the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences for her analysis of economic governance, especially the commons. In 2020, I read a book about her work, I think it was called Rules for Radicals, uh, which is all about managing the commons. And at the time, I found it really inspiring. I mean, I still find it inspiring, <laughs> definitely. Um, at the time, I was working on Gov.uk Pay, which is a payments platform. Um, and I was sort of taking a lot of inspiration from what she'd written and what she'd researched. But I found that when I joined the Gov.uk design system team, um, it meant it made a lot more sense and there was so much more of it was really applicable. Um, and so it started feeding into my work. Her work defined eight rules for managing a commons and I'll sort of take you through those and how I think they apply to design systems. So the first rule is that commons need to have clearly defined boundaries. Uh, and this is where the, the boundary of the gov.uk design system is actually quite concrete and I think quite different to what you're doing. So the gov.uk design system is just for uh, central government services who are putting things on gov.uk. It's, it's not white labeled and it's not uh, wider, but that sort of helps constrain and focus like how the resource is managed and used. Um, other parts of the public sector do take it and use it and adapt it and like that's sort of great. And we also found out that you know, parts of the private sector have taken it and adapted it as well. And, and that is a great benefit, but the, the point of uh, the thing is to manage it for services associated with Gov.uk. So that sort of constraint just like helps with managing it. The second rule is that rules should fit local circumstances. And so there's no one size fits all approach to like common resource management. But the way in which you manage it should not constrain participation or use. Um, so you can't like deliberately exclude people. You've got to sort of like actually like pay attention to the way that you're managing this common resource. Uh, the third one is, is probably quite obvious, but yeah, participatory decision making is vital. Um, there are all kinds of ways to make it happen, but people will be more likely to use a design system if they've had a hand in creating it. And that's where we're really leaning into that community effort there. Um, if you involve as many people as possible in the decision making and then make those decisions transparent, it just makes you know, the whole thing a lot more trustworthy. Um, one of the experiments the team were running in recent years was uh, collecting together people from departments to co-design components and patterns together. And actually it, it worked out pretty well um we were able to take like a load of different examples from across government and bring them together quite rapidly and come up with something that works for everyone um and then we also started adding uh, all of the research that we'd done uh, we started recording a lot more of that in the design system and making it available to people because you know everyone just wants to see how things got decided uh, fourth rule, commons must be monitored. So yeah, monitoring is critical to ensuring the consistency and quality of a design system so that you can maintain its integrity. And that encourages accountability as well. 
Uh, there is a working group that regularly reviews things in the Gov.uk design system and sort of what they talk about is made openly available. This is a funny one. I'm not always sure how this one applies, <laughs> but uh, sanctions for those who abuse the commons should be graduated. Uh, I think the way that this applies to a design system is rather than just rejecting poor quality contributions outright, you can actually implement a process where contributors receive feedback and guidance on how to improve their submissions. And I think that sort of takes it in a, slight, a slightly different way. Um, you've got to remember that these rules come from managing a commons resource like a pool of water. And so obviously this is trying to protect people pouring chemicals in the water or sort of, you know, letting their animals uh, uh, yeah, go to the toilet in it. So I'm not quite sure how that works with a bit of a controlled design system, but I think a nice way to take it is actually just to provide people with more feedback. Um, conflict resolution should be easily accessible. Uh, so yeah, when issues come up, resolving them should be informal, cheap and straightforward. Uh, so very much like a code of conduct that we had at the start of this or contribution criteria. The seventh rule, commons need the right to organize. Uh, teams across government departments need the autonomy to create and manage their own design systems while still contributing to and benefiting from the, the common resource. So that's, again, be consistent, not uniform. Commons work best when nested within larger networks, which is the final one. So the common resource is influenced by and has influenced the wider network around it. So here we're thinking about browser vendors, HTML and CSS specs, components and patterns from other organizations. You get the picture. Um, but yeah, I'll just leave these rules up there again, just in case you want to sort of take a look at them and think which ones uh, might apply to you. Um, People do talk about the tragedy of the commons a lot, but it's not inevitable. I think those common resources we create, the common goods that we work on in government, these are all shining examples of what open source could be. Uh, and to make that possible, or at least on the Gov.uk design system, we sort of had to change the hiring strategy a little bit. I pitched that we should really be hiring community managers, not more designers and developers. Uh, so yeah, I was asked to come up with a growth strategy uh, and, you know, growth usually means building more things and the obvious choice is to hire more designers and developers, but I don't think that's necessarily the route to creating the most value. A community manager can go out there and work with the community to produce components and patterns which meet some of those rules for managing the commons, and they do cost a lot less than a designer or a developer. You will get more bang for your buck if you hire a designer or a developer to be a community manager, I will say that, but you know, in general, you can get a higher return on investment. Right now, I'm lucky enough to be working with people who believe in the power of sociocracy and common resources again. Uh, so this is the open digital planning community, and we're working on building digital planning and housing services like with town planners. Uh, so we have a couple of product teams, but then we have a whole raft of community managers. And what we're really doing is working to co-design these services uh, with the, the planning ecosystem. Uh, so yeah, there's a heck of a lot of community managers. Anyway, we've talked about the common direction bit and at the start you, you would have seen the boring magic word and you're like, what about that? Like, why did you mention that? And so I think really, if we're all going the same direction, we also need to know where we're going. And this is all about the why and sort of having a common vision to work towards. Because um, if we're all putting an effort to contribute to and maintain this common resource, like why are we doing it? And I, I think what we do is we create boring magic. So back in 2019, I was working on a team who were thinking about what digital government services in the near future might look and feel like. Uh, and at the time, Connor, our interaction designer, he summed up uh, the UK's digital transformation effort rather well. And he said, we essentially create boring magic. Where that comes from is that there are boring things that people have to do, like pay tax and register a vehicle and work out what to do with dead farm animals. And these things only exist because of gov government. So our job building these digital services is to make these tedious things a little bit magical, you know, like simple, clear and fast. Something that's convenient and just works the first time. It's really helpful to speak to normal people to get some perspective on this. And there's a barber that I used to visit in South London. Uh, he'd often forget that I'd been in before and he'd ask me what I do for a living. So I'd say, oh, you know, I work on gov.uk, the, the government website. And he'd be like, oh, yeah, I know, I know what you mean. And he, uh, he came up with this one quote one time when he said, 
they had to apply for their daughter's passport recently and like it was good which is interesting you never hear people say that um yeah they like took a picture on on her phone all done within 10 minutes and they got back to watching television and they didn't have to like go to a post office and hire a photographer and all of that sort of thing and when you actually know what's going on behind the scenes like he's got no idea of the complexity of, of what's actually happening you know like all the gubbins behind the curtain he's just done what he needs to do and moved on with his life and and that's boring magic really so yeah boring magic respects the public we serve because it's caring when you need it and it gets out of the way quickly otherwise it's just good user-centered design that delivers positive outcomes for the public and i think that's the goal of digital transformation in government really it's what gets us out of bed in the morning It's what makes a difference for the public uh, and it's that common direction that we have so thank you Wow, that was fantastic. Um, thank you so much, uh, Steve. Uh, I want to ask everyone, like, if you um, you have any questions, do feel free to put them into the chat um, or put them onto uh, onto Miro. Um, I will also, in the meantime, uh, share my slide. Um, dun -dun -dun. Yeah. So any questions you can uh, you can put them in the chat. I see Renee said it was a lot of information. Yes. Um, I really like this definition of, um, of boring magic. Uh, I think like in in our industry, a lot of people want to you know make really exciting uh, things. Um, but like yeah, sometimes we need to make the boring things more uh, more interesting. Uh, and there's some magic in that uh, in itself as well. Um, yeah, let me see if there was questions in the Miro. It doesn't look like it. I, I think you've like explained everything very um uh, very clearly. Um, I see a question from Jeroen in the chat. Speaking of communities, what's something that you've encountered that really helped create a community around a design system? Good question. Yeah, tips for us. Um. So the, the place that most people tend to start, which isn't the best place, is they just think about the platform first and they're like, where, where are we going to hold this? How are we going to host it all? I think in some ways you do have to think about that in a more like hybrid future when we're all working together. But really, you just have to like get some people together and start talking about things. Um, it's good to sort of do a bit of a lean copy approach, you know, where you just sort of ask people what they want to talk about and sort of bring that stuff together. Um, Another good thing is initializing at the start, like what is that common direction? So what are we all here to try and achieve? What do we want to get out of this? That's a really good way to like start off a community. Um, and the way to keep it going is really just like keep turning up. Um, it's good if someone can sort of do that community manager role of deciding what happens next and keeping the topics coming through. And then if you're doing that community manager role, like look for the people that can catalyze the community as well. So the people who have really good input or tend to bring like really exciting things because you will at some point have to do some work behind the curtain to just like you know bring people along or suggest to people that they create some topics um but yeah really it's just sort of getting a thing started and keeping the ball rolling and you feel like it works better with people who are also designers and or developers if they do community management um i think so yeah so we at gds we had communities of practice and they were always based around your job role um there were some actually the design system community is the first time that really you have designers and developers and then maybe uh, accessibility specialists and product managers coming together which is quite nice um but yeah i think yeah start with what you know works or what you've seen work before and then try and expand it a little bit well, we got one more question from Robert. Uh, I suppose the Coffee UK design system team could not only consist of specialized community managers, but more is better. What's a good balance? Very good question. I definitely tried to work that out in some spreadsheets. Um, at the time, the well, yeah, even now, so the Coffee UK design system is at an interesting phase where it it does sort of, it does need to grow in the sense of it needs to cover, like in my opinion more use cases and sort of more components and patterns and, and different applications 
of the design system. So it still needs that core team. The core team is also heavily focused on accessibility. Like that is the biggest value that um, the rest of government gets from the WK design system team is someone to like check the accessibility of everything that, that is produced. And then also the people that understand the system of the design system and how it all needs to fit together. Like that is the real quality control and maintaining the integrity of the design system that yeah, the designers and the developers do. Um, but yeah, when I was in the team last year, we had we were about a team of 20. So a product manager, a delivery manager, uh, a community manager, and then 17 other people who work on um, products and services. And our uh, single community manager was overstretched. I, I, I was pitching to add two more just to see if we could, yeah, a team of 20. I was pitching for um, two more just so that we could see what we could get out of having three community managers because we could really do a lot with that. Um, but yeah, hopefully, hopefully that helps. Wow, yeah, great. I, I love that you've used the spreadsheet to uh, to work it out too. Um, yeah, I think we've looked at that too. Uh, fantastic talk. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, I'm afraid that's all we have time for in terms of questions, but I do want to thank you very much for um, for joining us today um, and closing off our uh, our conference week. Um, so yeah, thanks uh, thanks Steve.